and hello and welcome to Peter the Scene Podcast, hosted by me, Andrew. And me, Rachel. Now, we're a true crime podcast aiming to put you, the listener, at the scene of the crime. And as always, listener caution is always advised. I also want to say some of the opinions or statements that I mentioned in this episode today, rightly so, wouldn't be said these days. By the time of the crime, they were. So please don't complain we said them. We don't agree with them. We're just repeating what was said at the time. Now, I want to give a huge shout out to Andrea Davis, because I think I possibly forgot to shout out when she first subscribed to us a while ago on Patreon. So if I did forget, apologies. And if I didn't, hi again. And I I also want to give a massive thanks to Susanna Drain, who is our latest Patreon subscriber. So thank you to all our existing patrons and to the latest addition to the family. Yeah, we welcome are... to the welcome to the family, guys. Exactly. Now we are recording these in advance slightly, so if you're wondering why we've not read your name out, if you've subscribed, we will in the next one we record after you first subscribe. Now, if you'd like to become a member of the family, then please head over to the show notes where you can listen to this podcast, and you can join for less than the price of a cup of tea or coffee or hot chocolate because it's Christmas. <laughs> Our first aim was to get Rachel a microphone, which she just showed me a moment ago. So, but we've, not, we've not plugged it in yet, so we need to set it up. And it'll, be, <laughs> it'll be ready for the next one. Nearly there, guys. Nearly there. And our next aim is to be self-sufficient, which means to get enough to cover the monthly outgoings, which we have in producing this, which at the moment is roughly 30 to £35 a month. So if you want to su- support us, please do. So, Rach, now that's out of the way, how have you been? Are you excited for the year ahead? So excited. And, uh, yeah, 2023, uh, one to watch, looking forward to it. How about you? Yes, I am excited for the year ahead. I think, pod-wise, it's going to be quite good for us and for our listeners and just life in general. It gets better every year, so yes. And I'm I think if you, if you look back at where we were in... 2021 entering 2022 like look how far we've come so yeah i agree definitely on the podcast front exactly but more importantly are you ready for some true crime andrew i was born ready our first episode of 2023 so now we have listeners in dozens of countries rachel as you know but they're currently the three countries that our show is downloading the most are the US, followed by the UK, and then Australia. And today's story covers the US, UK, and Australia. So hopefully this will yeah, add to the interest appeal for the listeners from those countries, and also for everyone else as well. Nice. Can't wait. Today, I'd like to take us back to September the 3rd, 1983, to the town of Exeter, which is in the beautiful county of Devon, in the southwest of England. And it dates back to at least 250 BC. Now, these days, it's known for having the highest number of homeless people in England per capita outside of London. So, possibly something not to be proud of. And so, But even though it's a small city of around 100 to 200,000 people, it has a lot of no- notable people hailing from it. Now, I'm not going to list them all because I don't want to, but except to say, probably one we've all heard of is Chris Martin, the lead singer of Coldplay. He was born there. So when you say a small population of around a hundred to two hundred thousand people, yes. is that because they can't? Is that because of tourism and like they can't? Like the census hasn't like fully got the population accurate. Like. Thanks for noticing that, listeners and <laughs> listeners. Just so you know, it's because I looked what the population was, and then I completely forgot the exact number, and I couldn't be bothered to reopen the web page again. So wow. I know I know it was a hundred and something. So I I just thought I'd try and gloss over that a little bit. Ah. But, um, but... Guys, this is why we are such a good duo, because I ask the questions that you guys are thinking. <laughs> yes. So sorry for my tardiness there. It was a hundred and something. I just can't remember. And I couldn't be bothered to open up another tab. So, <laughs> but, so Chris Martin now, going back to Chris Martin, a single Coldplay. He would have only been six on this day in 1983. So he's definitely not a criminal or a victim. And on this day, the temperature was a nice 17 degrees Celsius, which is around 62 degrees Fahrenheit. 
and it was 1pm and a man parked his car near a local race course in Exeter unsurprisingly called Exeter Racecourse. <laughs> he parked in a wooded area and got out of his car. Once he did, he smelled something not good. And oh. he, yeah, he investigated and he found a human body decompo- oh. decomposing. Yes, happy ooh, January, guys. Yes, happy January. Now, the body had been hidden among bracken and young trees at a spot known as Round Plantation near the busy A38 road. Now, understandably, he was in a state of shock almost immediately, but still had the wherewithal to find a public telephone, and he called the police. Once the police arrived, they initially could determine that the body had gunshot wounds, that the body was one of a female, and that it had been decapitated. Oh, wow. So, despite using dozens of police officers and several police dogs, they were unable to find the head of the woman. So they had very little to go on. They knew she had been shot, and they could determine it wasn't with a shotgun. They thought that she was aged between 15 and 30, which is a pretty wide gap, isn't it, right? Yes, yes, that's very, like, rough police work. A bit like your um, your guess at their population. <laughs> Were you <laughs> working on the case? <laughs> I might have been, yeah. Um, they, <laughs> they knew that she was slim and about five foot one inch tall. I guess they had to guess her height because they didn't have a head in. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say Oh, I'm joke sorry. Though. It's really inappropriate. Sometimes, though, there is like the odd occasion where we are chuckling and we're not chuckling at the crime and the victim, obviously. No, but I, yeah, we, yeah we, sorry for the disrespect there. Sometimes it's about something that we've made a mistake and we uh, have edited it out, but you can still hear a chuckle going on in the background. So, upon further investigation, they were not able to determine who it was, but they were able to recreate the clothes. The t-shirt and shorts that the woman was wearing in order to appeal to the public. Now, it's worth noting that two days after the body was found, on the Monday, because it was found on a Saturday, the papers stated, sorry, the papers started reporting on it. Some described the body as being scantily dressed. Now, she was wearing t-shirts and short a t-shirt and shorts. When I think of it, it's hardly what you think of scantily, is it? Yeah, if if you if you'd have read me that headline and then said guess what she was wearing, I'd have immediately thought about like stockings and like you know some sort of like dress that barely covered her butt and her boobs. But I would say shorts and t-shirt is like summer clothes, so. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I mentioned I mentioned it because I'm going to be talking about the report in the newspapers later on. Oh, okay. it, it goes to show how bad it was back then. Am I going to get? I feel like I'm going to get really angry during this episode. <laughs> uh, know, is that going to happen? Do you know what? When I was writing it, I, I thought to myself, Rachel's going to get really angry with this. Oh, brilliant! Here we go, guys. <laughs> it's amazing. Like Enjoy. that, I, I did literally think that Rachel's going to get angry with this. Um, they determined that she had been shot at close range in the back in the neck, and they guessed in the head too, although obviously they didn't have the head. They said the crime bore similarities to a terrorist execution. This shows, and again this shows the quality of reporting, because some of the newspapers reported that the police were waiting on results of dental checks to determine the identity of the woman. Now, I'm not sure why they thought that, given they had no head or teeth, but, um, but... and it's the same article, right? At the beginning, they say decapitated, and then t- towards the end of the article, they say, and the police are waiting on dental checks. And I was thinking, hmm, yeah, maybe those checks, they're still waiting on them. No, absolutely. I'm sorry. I had to go on mute. I um, I can't control myself. That is bad reporting. Yeah. I know, because at first I, was, I, I, I thought, have I missed something here? They, they found a head. But then, I'm like, no, they didn't find a head. Um, God, you're on the ball. Yeah. Now, they initially thought the woman had been dead around 16 days. I want you to remember that fact as well, 16 days. And possibly thought it could be a woman called Veronique Marr, who was a French student who had gone missing the previous month in the Lake District. Now, it wasn't Veronique because she was later found dead, unfortunately. She had died by accidentally falling off a cliff during a hike. Actually, I'm going to throw this in here. I didn't put it in the scripts. 
she was featured for Veronique on uh, Crime Watch, which loads of people love. Oh yeah, crime. R.I.P. Crime Watch. Yeah. Now it wasn't. Um, it wasn't anything suspicious how she died. It was an accident. But interestingly, when they were searching for her body, they found another body. Uh, which was a woman who husband had killed her. Oh wow! And they only and they, he got, later got arrested and sentenced, and that only happened because they were searching for Veronique. So, oh. um, it, it, it's interesting how it all, all ties up, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I um, I really admire like the police work that's done as well because that's obviously. I mean, I don't know, you haven't really gone into detail there, I don't know how long that woman had been missing for, but the fact that they have kind of stopped at nothing to find Veronique um, after that and then uncovered another tragedy and then also, you know, been able to put a criminal behind bars is is epic. Yeah, no, they didn't find her body for quite a while afterwards, but, um, but they managed to put out, in addition to the original appeal, like shortly afterwards, details of the t shirt and shorts, which were quite distinctive. The pink shorts and a t shirt made in Morocco. Now upon seeing that appeal, a woman called Christina Percy, who was worried about one of her friends she hadn't seen in a while, recognised the clothes as belonging to her friend and she contacted the police. Now it would be determined that the body was in fact her friend, a twenty seven year old Mon- Monica Zumsteg Telling who who originated from California in the United States. So now we know who it was, let me introduce you to Monica. Monica Zumsteg Telling was born Monica Elizabeth Zumsteg on the 24th of November 1956 in Santa Rosa, California. She was the oldest of three children, older sister to twins Mark and Erica, who were five years younger than her, and she came from a loving, happy family. Now, by the time 1980 came, she was 23 years old and living by herself, still in California, but in Sacramento now, and she had a successful career at a software company. Now, Monica's parents and her two younger siblings still lived in Santa Rosa, and they had a passion for motorbikes, which they passed on to their children. Now, one Sunday morning in 1980, in August, I believe it was, remember this is three years before they found a body. Yeah. But one Sunday morning in 1980, they were indulging in their love of motorbikes by going for a motorbike ride with each other. As you do. Their, their daughter Erica as well, and some of their friends. Now, Monica wasn't with them. When they pulled up to a stop sign, they saw a man, quite young, on a special edition Harley Davidson, a, Sturg- a Sturgis. Now, they struck up a conversation about motorbikes with him as they admired his bike, because they were motorbike enthusiasts. And they invited him to visit their home. The man they invited was a British man called Michael Telling. Now, Michael took them up on the offer, and he visited them a few times, getting on well with both of them and their kids. In fact, Erica, their daughter, he took a keen interest in, trying to woo her with gifts and whatnot, but she wasn't interested in anything much more than being friends. Now, the parents... Lou and Elsa, they were the perfect hosts. Hosts. They spent many a weekend and evening showing Michael around all of the sites of the local area. But it came to a point when they had nothing left to show him. So, still being super hospitable, they suggested he go and spend a short while with Monica in Sacramento. And he could have someone new to explore, and she could host him as well. Now, before I carry on, how many people do you find like this? Like. Yes. You don't do it. It's a different life, different lifetime, isn't it, a girl? But so he took them up on the offer, and after a while, Michael and Monica fell in love, spending oh. all the spending all the time together, and they announced they were to be married. Now they were, they were to be married later that year in 1980. So who was this Michael Telling, and what did he do, and how did he end up in the states? It was 1980. So while people did move between the UK and States, it wasn't anywhere near as common as it is these days. Especially not for extended periods of time, so Lou and Elsa, and Monica actually, once they became romantically involved, they did ask Michael what he did, what his business was, which is a normal question. 
Now, he simply told them that he worked for the British Secret Service and the Australian High Commission and that he couldn't talk about what he did. Yeah. Now, we may laugh and think, how can anyone fall for that? But let's just, let's just think about this a moment. This was a time before the internet mm. where there was still a bit of mystery among people when it came to people from other cultures. And here we have a young, well-spoken, relatively good-looking, well-dressed, seemingly wealthy young man who was in the States riding around on an expensive bike, seemingly with no deadline on getting back to the UK. Now, if someone pictured a British spy back then, they'd probably think of James Bond. <laughs> and, and Michael easily fitted that part. Wow. But spoiler alert, I don't think I need to give this. He wasn't a spy. So let's find some more about him, shall we? Michael <laughs> Hen. Sorry. No, I was going to say, I've just recently watched a Netflix documentary. On this? Um, n- oh. Puppet Master? I don't know what that is. No. Well, you would have, from researching this, you'd have known if they were connected because it's a pretty okay. big Netflix documentary. But was there some sort of, like, you know, I don't know, obsession with spies in the 80s? Because, like, it, your man who was at the center of the the Netflix documentary was obsessed and he had all these he had a trail of women but yeah don't know whether that was just like maybe James Bond was at its peak then as well where you know like nowadays you get men and women on like Tinder Snapchat and all of that pretending like they live this luxurious life maybe in the 80s pretending to be a spy was the height of like it sexiness could have been. whatever I don't think these are links. I think it would have come up. I tend to stay away from most Netflix documentaries now. Because yeah, they're, they're quite they're biased, overdone. aren't they? Yeah, and yeah, uh... and yeah, and I also think that once you've got some a platform like Netflix, you've got a lot of like um, sofa like experts as well who kind of get involved on the internet, and then it's really hard to determine the truth from the, yes. the theories. Yeah. So sorry. I, go on. That's okay. So Michael Henry Maxwell Telling was born in 1950, so he was 30 when he met Zumstex. Again, a great age to be a spy. And he was the only child of Joyce Vesty and Henry Willis Maxwell Telling. Now, at the time he met the Zumstex, he didn't have a job. And in fact, he'd never had a job. Uh, He didn't work for the Secret Service, so he'd never had a job in his life. So the reason he could travel to the States and elsewhere in the world... It's because of who his family was and who they were. His mum, Joyce, was part of the Vesti family. And at the time in 1980, they were estimated to be the second wealthiest family in Britain, only behind the royal family. Now, these days, they're nowhere near that limit, but they are still still uber rich. The family owned a chain of butchers you may be familiar with in the UK called Dewhurst. In the 1980s, they had over 400 shops. And they also produced tin goods such as tin by pies and tin meats. So Michael didn't work because he didn't have to. He was the recipient of a trust fund which gave him a healthy allowance and also it paid any bills that he may have in life. Wow. Yes. So why did he lie, Rachel, when telling the truth would have been impressive enough? We may not- I feel I feel like you're going to tell us the answer to that, but it, that it's going to be some sort of, like, he needed to get his thrills from somewhere because clearly, like, you know, he didn't lead this exciting life that he expected to or that most people thought he would, being so rich. Uh, I see. We'll never know why he lied because we never found out, but we oh. know that we know that he did. Now, they, however, didn't know that yet. The truth would come out later on in 1980, before the wedding, Now, it came out as Michael had to confess about something else, so he told them this as well. Can you guess what he had to confess about, Rachel? Killing another woman, beheading her. No, no, unfortunately not. Uh, Well, as the wedding approached, Michael had to confess to Monica and her family that he couldn't get married. He couldn't get married because he already was married. Oh, Michael. He married Alison Webber two years earlier in 1978, and in 1979, they had a son together, Matthew James Maxwell Tellin. Because obviously, when you're that rich, you have to pass the names on that stuff, don't you? Yeah. So by the time 1980 came around, he had split with Alison, and they were in the process of getting a divorce. But 
that he hadn't gotten a divorce yet, which is why he couldn't get married. And he waited until right before the second wedding. Yeah. Now, they did love each other, though, Monica and Michael. So it, this getting this news didn't change the way Monica felt about him. So instead of getting married, they moved to England to live together until the divorce could be completed and they could get married. Now, they initially rented a house in Tunbridge Wells, Kent, and Monica would make lots of friends because Michael liked to socialise, plus she was a good person. Everyone liked her and she got on well with everyone. Now, it's there when she they were in Tunbridge Wells in Kent that she met Christina, if you remember, Christina Percy from earlier. Yeah. And the one who called pol- the police to tell her about the body. Yeah. Who she thought was Monica. Now, the pair would soon form a bond and share everything in their lives with each other, both good and bad. It wouldn't be long before Michael's trust fund helped him buy a property called Lambourne House near High Wycombe in Buckinghamshire. Michael's divorce, um, and I had a look actually, it's, it last got sold about eight years ago for about two and a half million pounds. So wow. um, it wasn't a small house. Michael's divorce finally came through. And on the 27th of November, 1981, they flew Monica's parents and grandparents out to England and they had a small wedding. In a, in the library, believe it or not, but they had a small oh. wedding. Um, now, skipping forward back to 1983, uh, when I wrote that, I thought, how can you skip forward back to 1983? But they did skip forward back to 1983, and the police contacted Monica's family in the States, and they identified the shorts her body had been wearing as ones Monica had bought when she lived in the States. Now, armed with this information, they still had to officially identify the body, and they knew she was married, so off they went to Michael's house that he shared with his wife. After all, logic would dictate that he either committed a crime or he thought his wife was missing and was worried about her and was looking for her. It had to be one of the two, didn't it? He either did it or he was looking well, for her. Well, yeah. 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 So this feels, from the way I'm telling it, that this all may have taken a long time, but in reality it was just a few days from the body being found to them turning up at his house. Now, when they did arrive at his house, he did, upon being spoken to, admit to killing Monica. But if he killed her, where was her head? Oh, God. And how did her body turn up some 300 miles away, roughly speaking? Yeah. And I wonder how the police approached it, like. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. So Monica had been shot several times, as the police suspected. In the back, in the neck, and in the head, with a rifle that Michael owned. He actually did this in March of 1983, either on the 27th, 28th, or 29th. So 17 months after their marriage. So she died way more than 16 days before, like the police had suspected. And when, when he, when you say that he actually did this on the you know, between these dates, 17th and yeah. 19th. Is that because he didn't make it clear when he did it? Or was he just saying, you know, basically at some point that weekend, I just lost my rag? No, it's because of all the reports, they either said the 27th, 28th ah, okay. or 29th. Sorry, and, yeah. and on their headstone, it said the 29th. I saw a picture of a headstone. But I I just put those days in because it, it differed. So it had to be one of the three. So, but it was way more than 16 days that the police had fought. Now, I'll get onto the excuse as to why he killed her in a moment, but he did. He put her body in a half-built sauna that he had on his property. So, it wasn't like he froze it or anything. So, I don't know why they thought it was 16 days, but five months later, for reasons he's never really explained, other than he thought he had to bury the body... And he didn't even bury it. He took the body out of the sauna. He put it in his car. Actually, he put it in a rented van. And he drove the 300 miles to the place where it was found. Before dumping the body, he thought, I want a memento. So he took an axe and he chopped her head off. 
He placed wow. it. In, he placed it in plastic bags, put it back in the van, and went home. Now, obviously, That's it, awful. Yes. Now, he, now obviously, he had to return the van, so he simply put the. Um, when the police turned up, they found Monica's head. It was still in the plastic bags, but he'd popped it in her in her mini that he, she had. So he still had that in his house, so he just popped it in the boot of the mini. Um, Not in the freezer. No. On the 12th of September, so only nine days after Monica's body was found, Michael appeared before Wanford Ma- Magistrates Court for a whole 90 seconds to see if he would have grant- granted bail or not. Now, the prosecution requested that he shouldn't get bail, and surprisingly, the defence did not disagree with them. So he was remanded into custody while the police further investigated. Now, I personally don't believe we'll ever know why exactly he killed his wife, but I'm going to tell you what happened during the trial, why he wasn't found guilty of murder, his reasoning behind the killing, but please remember, we don't have Monica to tell her side of the story, so we shouldn't take Michael's version with a pinch of salt. I believe we should probably take it with a bucket of salt. <laughs> but I'm also going to touch on Monica's friend Christina's thoughts on the marriage, some from her family, and what happened to Michael after the trial. On Monday, November the 8th, the police notified at one of the regular hearings to see if Michael should remain in custody. And each one, by the way, because there was regular hearings, because each time it went up and the police was like, we're still investigating it, can we keep him in custody? And every time Michael's defence said, yep, we've got no bother with that. Because yeah. I imagine if they would have contested it, because he had the best lawyers in the country, he would have got out, but for some reason they didn't. And, but on Monday the 8th of November, they, the police notified him my sure court that the investigation was complete. And they would be sending the file to the Department of Public Prosecutions, or the DPP as it is known. Now the DPP would take Michael to trial for the murder of his wife. At no point during the trial did Michael, or his defence, ever try to say that he wasn't the one that killed Monica or dumped her body. He admitted everything. Oh yeah. Christina, her friend, would testify that Michael loved to party, and it got worse and worse. He would become a regular user of drugs, and he would invite some unsavoury characters and be quite aggressive and abusive towards Monica. She would, she said that Monica often confided in her about this and said an example of the types that would attend his parties would be skinheads. Now we've got to remember this is the 1980s, so I'm talking about the far right, right racist type, not the scar-loving friendly type. Oh, okay, okay, got you right. I was going to say, is this one sort of different? Like, um, yeah. yeah. You know, you, you've got quite nice skinheads who are not racist at all, who just like the music scar, and then you've got ones who are not nice at all. So Monica's father said that when she told him the trouble she was having with Michael, they asked her to come home to America, but she refused, saying that she felt if she stayed, she could help Michael turn the corner, settle down, and be a good person. And that, sh- that really paints a picture of what she was like as a human. She didn't want to just run away and abandon him, but wanted to help him. Exactly. Now, she would speak regularly in the form of her family until March of 1983. Her family were worried when the contact stopped, but they assumed she wasn't contacting them because she was concentrating on her marriage and helping Michael. And I guess, like, back then, because it was just telephone, she, they might have gone, oh, well, she could have called, but we were out. You know, yeah, yeah. kind of, it's all brushed off. Whereas nowadays, it's like, no, her cell phone hasn't pinged for like two days. Oh my God, she must be dead. Exactly. Now, when she did go missing, her friend Christina said that she asked Michael where she was. And Michael told her that she had gone back to the States. And he invited her to his home to look for her. But she said she refused the offer because she didn't feel safe. Wow. Why would Did she go to the police at that point? No. Cause she, I guess because she had no proof. Michael was saying she was in the States. Now, during the time after he killed her, but before she was found, Michael told her friends that she had left after an argument and was back in the States. And he even went as far, I guess he's sort of having lots of money you can do, he even went as far as to hire a private det- detective to find her. 
and he also used her bank cards at various places to make it seem like she was still alive. Because I guess they didn't have CCTV back then, so he could use it and people wouldn't notice him. Now, Michael, I better get on to why he said he was not guilty, seeing as he admitted killing her. Michael said, would say that he was not guilty because he had lost control. He said that during the marriage he had repeated affairs, that she slept with many men and women, and would often taught him about her lesbianism. So ah. his his words, not mine. He would state that this is what made him lose control and kill her, and that he couldn't be responsible for murder, just manslaughter. Because now, he was homophobic and felt inclined to kill her. Because right? she was t- taunting him, apparently. Now, Michael was on trial. Let's remember this. Yeah, the prosecution called multiple witnesses denouncing Monica as a drug addict, a lesbian, an alcoholic, and that she had sex whenever she wanted, that she had openly had contempt for Michael, and that she only loved his money. I mean, I hope that his family, her family, sorry, didn't travel for that trial. Uh, they didn't travel, no, but they called witnesses to the stand, stating that Monica destroyed her lives. Two women were called, stating that she had turned them into lesbians. Uh, that she would openly smoke cannabis in her bed and had to ha- and have sex with them while Michael was there to taunt him. Michael would be quoted as saying, his words, she often taunted me with these affairs with both men and women and constantly belittled my sexual efforts, saying that I was only good for money. Even one of the woman's boyfriends, who apparently Monica turned into a lesbian, was called to testify to confirm that it was Monica that turned his girlfriend into a lesbian. Now, the prosecution portrayed Michael to be devoted to Monica, but her actions made him snack. Now, both... Snack? Sorry, her actions made him snap. Sorry. He just (laughs) always felt hungry when he realised his wife was with other women. Exactly, yes. Now, both the prosecution and defence called witnesses, or expert witnesses from psychiatrists, with a defence witness claiming that Michael had lost control and didn't know what he was doing, therefore couldn't be found guilty of murder. Wow. Uh, and the prosecution witness said that he was sound of mind, pointing to the fact that he saw her body, he pretended she ran away, yeah. and made excuses up, and then he dumped her body, keeping the head. And yet, like within that, within those months that he did keep her body, he could have he had ample time to confess to the police of his periodic episode where he wasn't of sound mind. Do you know what I mean? He was consciously making every day making a decision not to free himself of that. Now you can imagine what the papers made of this. They love this because here you have a very rich, wealthy man saying all these things about his wife including being a lesbian. So very few of the papers questioned the prosecution side of events. One or two did, but very few of them. Most of them portrayed Monica to be out of control. It's just so frustrating. Sorry to interrupt you. It's so frustrating when we know what we know now and in at times things haven't changed. We have not come much further. You know, women... Um, are always blamed, you know, well, she shouldn't have been walking alone at night. Well, she shouldn't have been wearing that. Well, she was asking for it. Well, she got too drunk. No, (laughs) like men also need to take accountability. 100%. Sorry. That's okay. So when when the trial concluded, the jury went out for deliberation. Now they were gone for just 150 minutes, two and a half hours. And they found him not guilty of murder, oh my God. but guilty of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. He would be sentenced to life. Now, after his trial, Michael would release a statement saying, and I'm quoting him here, that he was pleased I have not been branded a murderer. Monica's father, after the trial, would say he wished he had never introduced the pleasant young man he met one day to his daughter who claimed to be connected not only to the British Secret Service, but also to the Australian High Commission. He said this, To put my daughter on trial like this was absolutely disgusting. To have to sit here seeing that in the papers every day 
unable to deny it, it was terrible. So Michael would be released some 10 years later. And wow. after, after his release, he moved to Australia to start a new life in Perth. Buying a house in the upper market area of Rosmoyne, he became accepted into the elite society of the area with no one knowing his past. He bought a house for 750 Australian dollars and some adjacent land for 300,000 Australian dollars, which would be equivalent of 2.1 million US dollars. So 2.1 million Australian dollars now, or 1.4 million US dollars, or 1.1 million British pounds. Even his best friend in Australia didn't know, the one who gave the eulogy at his death. With the information coming out about who he was only after his death in 2010, with his friends describing him as a generous but quiet English gentleman. So, we have two different sides here, Rachel. Her friends and family saying this was not like her, and Michael's side saying she drove him to it. So let's be clear, though. To start with, whichever side is right, and it's up for you guys to listen to this side, it doesn't give you permission to kill someone. No, absolutely not. Somebody's life choices and their behaviour, like, fair enough, you can choose not to be a part of that or present when they behave like that, but you have absolutely no right to take the law into your own hands and deal with that person. Like, exactly. exactly. Now, before I ask you your opinion on on if you think... I think I know your opinion, but if you fit your opinion, I'll tell you mine because I'm going to include some information that I've not mentioned yet. Now, I personally believe that Monica wasn't like that. If she was just after his money, then why did she get with him before she found out how wealthy he was? Yeah. If she was just after his money, why did she tell her friends and family about the trouble she was having? Surely she would just... Paul with it because he can spend his money. Yeah. And if she was just after his money, why taunt him? Why not keep him happy so she can carry on spending his money? Because and he also, has endless amounts of money. The women that testify and the men that testified against her character, were they getting paid off? Were they well, investigated? I'll, I'll, like... I'll, get, I'll get to that. Oh, sorry. I, they weren't investigated, no. But I believe them. it's a bit suspicious. So I know these are just questions, but... What was also on the record about Michael is that during his time in England after he returned with Monica, he'd gotten in trouble with the police. He'd been arrested several times. He'd been found guilty of the illegal possession of firearms, uh, for discharging the firearms too, for his drug use, for criminal damage, for disturbance of the peace, and the police also got called numerous times to break up parties that turned bad on his property. Now... Every time he got away with it with the minimum possible um, punishment or even sometimes not even any punishment, I guess because he had the money, but they were on document that these things happened. So why keep his body? So why keep her body? A few days before he dumped it, why did he go to his ex-wife and tell her that Monica had left him and give his ex-wife all of Monica's jewellery? And why did he keep her head afterwards so why would the two witnesses who claimed that she turned them into lesbians which is nonsense by the way you can't turn someone gay um why would they state that they were suddenly moving to go and live in spain after the trial when they were not wealthy where would that money come from that they could suddenly start a new life and buy property in spain after the trial um no one ever Ask that question. Oh, exactly, exactly. So I personally f- just think that he had enough time to think of a plan. Then when he did get caught, who knows? Maybe keeping the head was part of that plan. Maybe not trying to get bail was part of that plan because then you could get a lesser sentence, so he may as well get some time served. I think when you combine these questions... We've been in him being able to afford the best defence in the country, which he did. He, he he bought the best lawyers in the country, solicitors and barristers in the country. 
I believe he quite literally got away with murder. Yeah. So what do you think, Rachel? Uh, absolutely, you're right. And there's a period of time where he has had enough time to plan methodically, like, and and be able to like um, cover eventualities, pay people off, set the scene, and then really uh, as well, if if he's educated them in in terms of their trial, you know, story. Um, and what's happened and even plant the seed that yeah your wife you know was with my wife and and then the husband's obsessed over it for a little while before it comes to trial like yeah so much time to plot that um and also like bad like really bad um case there where like things have just not been investigated uh, thoroughly um allowing him essentially to categorically not be convicted of murder which to be fair on the jury is the right thing to do because unless it is case closed you know 100 percent, everyone is confident they should not convict criminals of murder and they should opt for manslaughter if it's not a watertight case so i think i agree completely with you and that's why this title this episode is is titled not evil just mad because when he got found guilty of manslaughter not murder that was the headlines in the newspapers the next day. Not evil, just mad. So, and that, that's the other thing. The newspapers have done nothing for this poor woman and her family in America. Like, yeah. So I, I was grateful that the family went at the trial, but I didn't even think that it would have made the American press. Yeah, yeah, it, it did, yeah. Um, so let me wrap this up then. For one last time, I'd like all of you to relax. Close your eyes and picture the scene. One of your friends or family, they're so excited to introduce you to the new love in their life. But that new love in their life seemed to be just a little bit too perfect. What are they hiding? And more importantly, what are you going to do about it? So thank you everyone for listening. Uh, It is the... We're releasing this on the 3rd of January, so it's a brand new year. Um, I hope it's everything that you want it to be. Yeah, I hope you stay with us this year and looking forward to uh, yeah, um, pr- producing more pods. Thanks for that episode, Andrew. That was really good. And I'll just pop this at the end before we hang up, because I don't say it often now, but ratings and reviews help us a lot. So if you can rate us on podchaser apple podcast or whatever um please do rate and review us it means a lot but only if you want to and so thank you and goodbye everyone bye